In my childhood, the past held a particular allure for me. The present seemed dull and mundane, lacking the grandeur and heroism that I imagined filled previous eras. This fascination with history set me apart from my peers. I found their interests shallow and trivial, while they saw me as an oddball lost in his books. After school, I could barely wait for the bell to ring. I would rush home, grab a quick bite, and retreat to my room, surrounded by my books and dreams. Within minutes of reading, I would find myself transported to the bloody and majestic landscapes of humanity's youth. I was especially drawn to the ancient world and the early Middle Ages. With Arminius and his warriors, I would run through the dense Teutoburg forest, trembling with rage, eager to confront the Roman invaders on my tribe's land. Or conversely, I would imagine myself as a soldier in one of the victorious legions, marching with Caesar as he subdued Gaul, landing with Scipio's military expedition on the Carthaginian coast, or fighting alongside Pompey and Trajan against the barbarian kingdoms of the east. I devoured stories of the victorious hordes of nomads, Huns to Mongols, that swept from the depths of Asia century after century, admired the heroism of the Spartans who stood against the vast Persian army and shuddered at the bloody details of Aztec sacrifices. It's no wonder that when the time came to choose a college, there was no question for me I was going to study history. Passing the entrance exams with little difficulty, I plunged into my studies. I hoped to find kindred spirits, people with whom I could discuss events that had occurred centuries and millennia before we were born. However, shortly after starting, I was somewhat disappointed. True devotees of Clio were few on our faculty. Most students preferred the simple, unrefined pleasures of modern life. Others were just pedantic grinds. In the end, I found understanding among only a few like-minded individuals, remaining an outcast to nearly everyone else. Yet, my studies on the faculty did provide me with something invaluable, a newfound appreciation for the history of my own region. Before this, I had dismissed it, thinking that all significant historical events occurred far from us. But during my studies, I was able to view the past of my homeland with new eyes. Like a sponge soaking up water, I absorbed new knowledge about the fierce Scythian nomads who scalped their enemies and made cups from their skulls, about the Bosporan kingdom and the principality of Tmutarakan, about the Genoese cities, and much more. I became a regular participant in archaeological expeditions, feeling immense satisfaction when uncovering a shard of pottery or a rusting knife crumbling before my eyes, extracted from an ancient burial mound. Sitting beside a freshly unearthed grave, I would peer into the hollow eye sockets of a skull, trying to guess what thoughts and feelings had once filled this now vacant vessel of reason. At the same time, I realized that even such excavations would never reveal everything to us, that much of what happened in past centuries would remain forever shrouded in mystery. It's hard to express how much this angered me. I felt like I was standing next to a massive chest full of thrilling secrets and enigmas, but I would never be able to open it. Again and again, I pored over thick historical tomes, tried to contact every esteemed scholar who might have something to say on the topics that interested me. But no matter the outcome of my inquiries, I still felt unsatisfied. I wanted to know so much more. Nevertheless, most of my questions remained unanswered. What particularly vexed me was the lack of modern science's understanding of the dolmen builders. 
This was doubly frustrating because these mysterious structures always struck me as the most remarkable and intriguing phenomena in our region. Imagine, these enigmatic houses of dwarves, as the Circassians called them, had stood here long before the first bricks were fired on the banks of the Nile, which would later form the foundations of the future pyramids. We know much about the pyramids, but almost nothing about the dolmens. Were they merely tombs or something more, primitive observatories or sanctuaries? Who erected these structures? The ancestors of modern Adiges, Aryan tribes, or someone else? I had read and heard countless speculations and theories on this subject. Some believed that the dolmens were an eastern echo of that ancient and enigmatic culture that dominated Europe long before the Celts, raising their first monoliths. Others argued that their origins lay in Asia, the homeland of all monumental structures of antiquity. Guesses and conjectures snowballed, but the more opinions I heard from various authoritative historians, the more I realized that I was drifting further from the truth. Even my own research, my willingness to work for almost nothing on any archaeological expedition digging up these structures, came to nothing. Most dolmens had long been looted and destroyed. Like most archaeologists, I ground my teeth in frustration at the thought of the priceless knowledge lost due to the stupid greed and ignorance of some medieval rabble. Realizing that conventional means would not reveal what I needed, I, out of desperation, turned to the occult. After all, some secret teachings suggested that through trance and altered states of consciousness, one could send their spirit back in time and learn the secrets of past centuries. I knew it sounded absurd, but my desire to uncover the mysteries of bygone eras outweighed the arguments of reason. I read every book on magic and ancient rituals I could find, spent entire nights trawling the internet, until I realized that most of what I learned was utter nonsense. I consulted with psychics from modern offices and healers from semi-abandoned villages. I spent all my meager savings on trips to the most remote and isolated corners of our country, seeking out the last shamans of dying out, narrow-eyed peoples lost in the vast expanses of the taiga and tundra. My interlocutors included lamas from Buddhist monasteries in Kalmykia and Tuva, immigrants from India who remained faithful to their religion, and followers of the Yazidi faith who worshipped the Kurdish devil. Melictaus. At night, I studied Carlos Castaneda and Alistair Crowley, whose works led me to the idea of finding a new yet undiscovered drug that could alter my consciousness enough for me to perceive events from the distant past. I seriously delved into the study of chemistry and pharmacology, even setting up a lab at home where, through countless experiments, I sought to find my philosopher's stone. These pursuits also forced me to become more familiar with the drug dealers in my area, which almost backfired. Only by sheer luck did I manage to evade the scrutiny of the narcotics police. But in the end, my persistence paid off. Late one sleepless night, gulping down coffee with a feverish gleam in my eye, I stared at a nondescript gray powder that had precipitated in one of the flasks. Beside it lay a piece of paper with a few phrases scrawled in Cyrillic, but these words were in a language unknown to any in the world, save for the secret scripts of cults, cursed and forgotten by the rest of humanity. Now I was fully armed for a battle with the all-powerful Kronos, from this merciless God, I intended to wrest the secrets of the houses of dwarves. The next day, I was already bouncing in the seat of an old bus, heading to a semi-abandoned village near the coast. 
In a separate pocket of my bag was a small vial of the coveted powder, next to which lay the slip of paper with the incantation. I knew that a few kilometers from this village stood a well-preserved dolmen, unknown to either tourists or archaeologists. I had stumbled upon it by accident while lost in the woods during one of my expeditions. Stepping off the bus onto a grimy square, I started down the main street, the only one in the village. The dusty road ran past rickety old huts, where scruffy chickens roamed near sagging or fallen fences. During my walk through the village, I encountered only three locals who eyed the city stranger with hostile curiosity. I couldn't suppress a sigh of relief when I finally reached the edge of the village and plunged into the forest. A barely visible path wound through dense bushes and ancient horsetails. Somewhere nearby, a stream babbled, frogs croaked, and the hum of insects filled the air. The towering trees above me spread their branches, almost completely blocking out the sun, which I was only too glad for. It was summer, and the sun was mercilessly hot. The path climbed steadily uphill. Suddenly the trees parted, revealing a small clearing covered in tall grass. A stream quietly babbled as it emerged from a crack in a large rock that towered at the other end of the clearing. And at its base stood the dolmen. Made from five stone slabs, it seemed to be flesh of the flesh of the towering rock above it. The relentless passage of time in the hands of looters had not spared the House of the Dwarf. The top slab had collapsed inward, and a significant chunk had fallen off the right wall. Yet even in its damaged state, this squat structure held a vague charm of dizzying antiquity and a certain mystery. I hoped that today I might finally lift the veil obscuring the secret of this stone tomb which had remained hidden from humanity in the darkness of the past centuries. The rest of the day was spent preparing for the ritual. In front of the dolmen, I cleared a large area of vegetation, then set off to gather kindling for a fire. By the time I had piled up a heap of dry branches and leaves before the dolmen, and after several failed attempts, got the flames to dance on them, it was already getting dark. Many of the flames were blue and green, which I took as a good omen. I scooped some water from the nearby stream and drank it greedily. That was all I could allow myself. The ritual I was about to perform required a strict fast. I then pulled from my bag a knife with a long, narrow blade and a black handle inscribed with magical symbols. Muttering incantations under my breath, I began drawing a large circle in front of the fire, moving counterclockwise. Once that was done, I stepped inside the circle and turning to each of the cardinal directions in turn, invoked Nergal, Moloch, Leviathan, and Melek Taos. Then I took out a large white sheet of paper folded in quarters and spread it out before the fire. With the utmost care I retrieved the vial of drug from my pocket and arranged three lines on the paper as if I were preparing to snort cocaine. One of the lines was very short, the second was longer, and the third the longest. Facing north, I loudly recited the incantation then dropped to my knees and, closing one nostril, sharply inhaled the shortest line. My head immediately began to spin violently, my vision darkened, and colorful rings swam before my eyes. The surrounding objects lost their clarity, everything blurred, and I awkwardly collapsed onto my side. Something thudded dully in my head. I shuddered and then plunged into darkness. I awoke on the same clearing by the stream. My entire body felt incredibly light, as if the slightest push would send me floating into the air. 
Glancing quickly at my hands, I saw that they had become semi-transparent. I realized that my first experiment had succeeded. In the form of a disembodied spirit, I had traveled to a distant past. The surroundings had changed drastically. The clearing had expanded several times over. The forest had receded, and cultivated fields now stretched around me. However, the fields were trampled and ravaged. At the edge of the forest, a small village was burning, its ruins scattered with bodies, and the water in the stream had turned red with blood. On the outskirts of the village stood a dolmen, now in better condition, which led me to conclude that I had indeed traveled back to ancient times. Nearby, a group of dark-skinned men and women had huddled together, their children clinging to their skirts and crying. I easily recognized them as a D people, and beside them on short horses pranced their haughty conquerors, stocky riders with narrow, slit-like eyes and yellow skin. There were nearly ten times as many of them as there were of their enemies, and more narrow-eyed riders appeared and disappeared among the trees. The sky was filled with smoke, evidence that other villages had been destroyed by the invaders beyond the forest. I realized that I was witnessing a raid by the Tatar horde, either during the time of Batu Khan and Subutai, or a later period. Perhaps it was a raid by Crimean Tatars, although I doubted it. The sheer power of the force I saw even from this small part of the army was far greater than that of the Ottoman Empire's vassal forces. Observing the richly decorated garments of some of the riders and the precise and controlled way they maneuvered their horses, I understood that I was dealing with the forces of a truly mighty empire, either from the era of the Golden Horde or an even earlier time, when the empire founded by Genghis Khan had not yet been shattered by his unworthy descendants. Suddenly, I saw the cruel joy on the faces of the Mongols turn to expressions of concern. They grabbed the reins of their horses, making them step aside reverently as someone on a sleek black stallion rode up to the captives. I stared intently at the face of this man, hoping to recognize which of the great Mongol conquerors had appeared before me. The leader of the horde was clad in armor and wore a conical helmet. A belt cinched his waist, bearing a simple symbol, three black circles arranged in a triangle. I knew what this symbol meant and almost gasped in awe. It was the emblem of Tamerlane, Timur the Lame, the last of the great Mongol conquerors who had made the world remember the times of Genghis Khan. Now, the Iron Lame One was gazing down at the captives, who awaited their fate with trembling anticipation. The great emir's eyes held neither anger nor pity, not even contempt. He looked at the Adai people as if they were nothing. It was the gaze of a man accustomed to sending thousands to their deaths without batting an eye, and then immediately forgetting about it. Without looking, Tamerlane extended his hand, into which one of his attendants promptly placed a curved saber with a hilt adorned with gold and precious stones. The conqueror took it thoughtfully, ran his finger along the blade to check its sharpness, and suddenly, with almost no wind-up, brought the blade down on the neck of the nearest Adi. The severed head rolled across the ground, spraying blood, and came to rest at the base of the dolmen. The emir touched the reins and, without another glance at the captives, began to descend the hill. His warriors respectfully made way for him, careful not to brush against the fearsome ruler with even the edge of their garments. One of his warriors immediately took the emir's place. Drawing his saber from its sheath, the Mongol rode up to one of the captives and silently swung the blade. One by one, Timur's warriors rode by, beheading the prisoners. The heads that rolled to the side were picked up and thrown onto a pile. Several warriors dismounted and efficiently began stacking these heads into a structure. Soon, the mysterious monument of an ancient era was hidden beneath a fearsome pyramid of round bricks. 
The Tower of Severed Heads was meant to instill terror in the hearts of the conquered people and deter them from resisting Tamerlane. Watching this brutal yet strangely majestic scene, I suddenly felt my head spin again, and I once more plunged into the blackness that would return me to my own time. I awoke lying on the grass near the stream. With a groan, I sat up and held my head in my hands. It ached as if after a night of heavy drinking. Tossing some twigs onto the dying fire and splashing my face with water from the stream, I sat down to think. Without a doubt, my experiment had been a resounding success. I had indeed managed to peer into the past. Moreover, I had stumbled upon a sensation. Imagine being at the very site where one of history's greatest tyrants had exacted his vengeance. With a fear bordering on reverence, I surveyed the surrounding clearing. What if that spot, where the grass grows less thickly, is the last remnant of the destroyed village? And if I were to dig up that mound near the dolmen, might I not find the skulls of the Adij people executed by Tamerlane? And what other secrets might this land hold? What if my experiments could completely overturn all our understanding of the region's history? Prudence suggested that I should take a break from the effects of the drug, but vanity and the thirst for knowledge urged me to continue my experiments. With trembling lips, I recited the incantation again and falling to my knees, inhaled another line of the powder. For several hours, my spirit wandered the lost paths of time. The more of the magical powder I inhaled, the further back in time my spirit traveled. My head still throbbed after each such immersion, but the unpleasant sensations receded into the background, giving way to the ecstasy of the experiences I was gaining. I saw how, at the foot of the mountain, the cohorts of Gaius Julius Aquila marched, sent here to punish the Bosporan king Mithridates Deity, who had dared to challenge mighty Rome. Villages burned, and heaps of corpses lay everywhere. With whoops, the Sarmatian allies of Rome galloped on their horses, lassoing fleeing captives, and the stern legionaries marched onward with fire and blood, bringing the laws of the greatest empire the world had ever known to these wild lands. I watched as Roman soldiers erected a watchtower here to keep the barbarians in check, further and further against the current of the river of time. I saw desperate Greek merchants from the first ancient cities of the Black Sea region making their way along these paths. I saw large, wealthy settlements that the Maotians repeatedly founded near the Dolmen. But it seemed as if a curse hung over this place. Time passed and these settlements were wiped from the face of the earth by new invaders. Thousands of years before Tamerlane's arrival, hordes of nomadic Scythians swept through here, dealing with their enemies as brutally as the legendary emir of Samarkand. With eyes wide with horror, I watched as the Scythians flayed the skin from their still-living captives. As they used short swords to tear out the hearts of the Maotians, drank their steaming blood, and drenched piles of kindling with the crimson liquid, atop which stood a sword, the symbol of the Scythian god of war. The entire history of humanity, in all its grandeur and bloodthirstiness, unfolded before my eyes. But it was a mere shadow of the truly terrible secrets that were then revealed to me. Despite all my journeys through the centuries, I had not come any closer to solving the mystery that had driven me to undertake this endeavor, the mystery of the Dolmens. In all my visions the Dolmen continued to stand in its place, surrounded by the same aura of incredible antiquity. And nothing among the peoples who passed by in a colorful kaleidoscope indicated their involvement in the construction of the House of the Dwarf. Throughout this time, I had only taken small doses of the powder, trying to use it sparingly. But my dissatisfaction with the knowledge I had gained pushed me to more decisive actions. 
This time, I poured out a much larger portion of the powder, several times greater than all the previous ones. Taking a deep breath, I leaned back and once again plunged into oblivion. When I awoke, I realized that I had now indeed traveled too far down the river of time. The forest was gone, and even the mountain was much lower, resembling only a small hill covered in sparse grass. The same rocks that had long wearied me still jutted from the earth. This time, they protruded much more from the ground and looked quite repulsive, like rotten teeth in an old man's mouth. The hill was surrounded by a chain of similar elevations, stretching to the blue sea in the west. Further south, the hills turned into real mountains. But these changes in the landscape did not hold my attention. I was not alone on the hill, as I had been before. Now there were at least twenty people on the hilltop, dressed in leather garments adorned with intricate bead patterns. They were short, dark-skinned people armed with spears, or more likely, harpoons, tipped with bone. Higher up the slope of the hill, shirtless men were laboriously moving large stone slabs, fitting them together. They clearly belonged to a different people than the harpoon-wielding warriors. Tall, broad-shouldered, with flat, expressionless faces and dark skin. The tattered rags they wore and the fresh scars on their bodies made their status clear. They were slaves under the watchful eyes of their overseers. Supervising them was a thin, elderly man dressed in a long robe that resembled a cassock. He held a long, gnarled staff, its carved top shaped like the snarling face of a wolf or dragon. I realized that I had finally achieved what I had sought. I was witnessing the legendary builders of the dolmens. There was no doubt about it. The structure that the dark-skinned warriors were straining to construct bore the unmistakable outlines of what would become the House of the Dwarf. A large slab with a hole in the center lay nearby, the opening seemingly punched through only recently, perhaps even just before my arrival. The origin of this people was no longer a mystery to me. Their tattoos, the patterns on their clothing, their weapons and their ornaments spoke volumes. At one time I had been intrigued by the theory that the Dolmen culture was connected to the mysterious monoliths that had been erected by unnamed builders in Western Europe, Stonehenge and others. I had read with interest the hypotheses of some scholars that the builders of these monoliths were distant ancestors of the modern Basques, as well as the Picts, a mysterious people who inhabited Scotland before the arrival of the Celts. These books contained illustrations depicting the tattoos of the Picts, and now I clearly saw the same designs on the exposed skin of the dolmen builders. The construction continued for a long time, but I had enough time to witness its completion. Now the dolmen stood atop the hill, though its monumentality was somewhat overshadowed by the towering rock above it. Even so, the freshly built dolmen exuded a certain grim power. I thought of the countless generations of builders who had erected similar structures across Europe long before today giving even this new dolmen a faint aura of antiquity. Meanwhile, the thin old man in the long robe, whom I now understood to be a priest, approached the dolmen and looked commandingly at his people. The crowd began to stir, and I saw on the ground a stretcher bearing the body of a richly dressed man. He was adorned with many ornaments, and his withered hand clutched a sword with a gilded, possibly even gold hilt. Four men lifted the stretcher and stood still, waiting. At the same time, the priest turned to face the sea and began to sing a hymn, raising his hands to the sun. I couldn't understand the priest's words, but it was clear that he was reciting some prayer to the gods of his people. This strange and wild melody was taken up by the warriors, who chanted the words of the barbaric hymn in strong voices. Despite its incredible antiquity, the hymn did not seem entirely unfamiliar to me. I had once come across a few recordings of various ethnic music, 
Among them were the chants of the Spanish Basques, Bertzolari, rhymed improvisations in a specific rhythm. And now, listening to the beautiful harmonies of the mountaineers, I could clearly discern familiar notes. The content of these songs was not entirely a mystery to me either. I distinctly heard the words sugar and ortsi. In various academic works, I had come across fragmentary information about Basque mythology. These were the names of the god of the sea and the god of the sun. And once again, I rejoiced at the clear confirmation of the wildest theory. The singing of the warriors and the priest was mesmerizing. Even in my disembodied form, I succumbed to the strange magic of the pagan chants. As for the slaves, they seemed to fall into a trance. Their eyes glazed over, their mouths hung open, and they swayed in time with the hymn, as if they had lost all sense of reality. I hadn't noticed when the bronze knife with a sharply honed blade appeared from the folds of the priest's robe. Without ceasing his chant, the priest approached one of the slaves, grabbed him by the hair, tilted his head back, and sliced his throat. Without making a sound, the slave collapsed at the priest's feet, blood gushing from his neck. The priest bent down, dipped his fingers in the crimson fluid, and smeared it across his forehead. Then he moved to the second slave and just as unhurriedly as if slaughtering livestock slit his throat. With each new victim, the face of another dark-skinned warrior was marked with bloody streaks. The blood of the last slave covered the face of the deceased leader with the priest paying special attention to anointing his lips. When the sacrifice was complete, the priest gave a commanding gesture and the stretcher bearers moved. They carried the leader's body to the newly constructed dolmen and carefully laid him inside. The priest began to chant another hymn while his people brought forward a huge, roughly hewn stone to seal the entrance to the leader's final resting place like a cork. The throbbing pain in my temples distracted me from the scene, and I realized it was time to leave. As the objects around me blurred, I cast a final glance at the place where one of the greatest archaeological mysteries had been revealed to me, and suddenly froze in place. The effect of the drug was wearing off, but I was exerting tremendous effort to stay for just one more moment, unable to believe what had suddenly appeared before my eyes. I had already mentioned that the rocks, in whose shadow the slaves were building the dolmen, protruded more from the ground at this time. And now, I noticed something unnatural about their shapes. Mesmerized, I gazed at the massive boulders that had broken off from the main massif, at a huge stone slab, half of which lay on the ground while the other half still jutted from the earth. At one end of this slab, a large piece had been carved out, forming an almost perfect semicircle. The last thought I had before finally slipping into unconsciousness was that the ruins of a colossal dolmen towered on the mountain, ancient beyond measure, so much older than the one I had witnessed being constructed, as the Egyptian pyramids are older than modern skyscrapers. I awoke on the now familiar meadow by the babbling brook. My head ached terribly, but I scarcely thought about it, consumed as I was by the itch of discovery. Overcoming my terrible weakness, I staggered toward the towering rock that loomed above the ruins of the dolmen, which no longer interested me. Now I knew that these homes of the dwarves were nothing more than a pathetic imitation of the architecture of those who came from immeasurably older times. I stood on the brink of a new discovery, one capable of overturning all our established ideas about ancient cultures and peoples. Little did I know just how right that assumption would be. Excitedly, I ran my hands over the ancient moss-covered stones. Though they bore no trace of craftsmanship, as I traced the cold surface of the rock, I could feel deep in my bones that human hands had touched these slabs before me. Or perhaps not human? 
the most absurd stories came to mind. Tales of Atlanteans, Hyperboreans, or even aliens. These theories, which had previously provoked nothing but a scornful smirk from me, now seemed neither far-fetched nor absurd. Indeed, who could have erected such a monumental structure in an age when official history suggests nothing but bent, ape-like beings scurrying after lizards under stones? Whose hands, or perhaps machines, had moved these colossal boulders, who had built these monumental structures with a purpose unknown to us, setting an example for the builders of dolmens? I now understood that the dark-skinned people had only aped the labor of their predecessors, unable to grasp the true meaning of this construction in all its former significance, interpreting it through the lens of their barbaric beliefs. But now I had the chance to uncover the true purpose of the dolmen's construction. However, I was currently too weak and seriously feared that I might not return after my next journey into the past. Yet the curiosity that gripped me was like an obsession. In fact, it was an obsession. I knew I would never find peace if I didn't solve this mystery now. At that moment, I had no idea that the answer could disturb my peace even more than if I had left those enigmatic ruins alone. By evening I felt the headache and the overwhelming weakness begin to recede, and I was ready to undertake my journey through the river of time once again. This time, I poured all the powder I had onto a sheet of newspaper. Dividing it into six lines, I began to snort them one by one, hurrying to avoid slipping into oblivion too soon. Strangely enough, I managed to do so, even standing for a moment in amazement that nothing was happening. The drug's effect hit me all at once. It was as if I had been struck in the head with a club, and I blacked out. When I came to, I was initially frightened. Had I ventured too far back in time this time? The landscape around me was so wild and unfamiliar. The mountains were gone. Instead, I lay on loose black soil in a damp lowland by the edge of a small river. To my right, a wall of giant ferns and horsetails towered, from which the stream flowed. And to my left? To my left stretched an endless blue expanse. The sea. Its waters were stained red by the rays of the setting sun. There were no mountains or hills here, and I realized that I had traveled to those prehistoric times when the Caucasus itself was merely a vast flat island, newly risen from the depths of the Tethys Sea. And directly above me loomed the reason I had ventured so far, a giant dolmen the size of a small house. In its center yawned a perfectly round, pitch-black hole into which a car could have easily fit. I was filled with mad joy that I had once again hit the mark and landed exactly where I wanted. But my elation quickly turned to bewilderment. There was no sign of the nameless builders. Having dreamed of witnessing an unprecedented construction, I was disappointed. There was no trace of the advanced civilization that I believed could have erected such a megalith. Apart from the dolmen itself, there wasn't the slightest sign that any human being had ever set foot in this place. Puzzled by this unexpected turn of events, I began to survey the surroundings again. I noticed that the ground around me was far from smooth and level. On the contrary, its entire surface was pockmarked with mounds of earth resembling the mounds left by moles or earthworms, only much larger. They dotted the area abundantly, leaving only the shoreline clear. The ground near the dolmen itself also remained untouched. The mounds started no closer than five meters from the ominous structure. Yes, ominous. That's how the giant stone house appeared to me now. No longer did I feel the euphoria with which I had embarked on this journey. The colossal dolmen no longer seemed like the construction of a highly developed civilization that I had imagined in my fantasies. It was a grim stone tomb, and even my ghostly spine tingled at the sight of it. 
nor did the swollen horsetails and club mosses growing nearby, or the earth mounds, bring me any comfort. Frightening thoughts about their origins began to surface in my mind. My anxious thoughts were interrupted by a rustling in the ferns. A giant centipede, no less than a meter long, slithered out, writhing its entire body. I involuntarily shuddered in disgust, even though I knew it couldn't see me. Rapidly moving its many legs, the giant insect glided between the mounds. It all happened so quickly that I didn't have time to react. One of the mounds suddenly exploded with clods of wet earth flying in all directions. A muscular clawed paw tightly grasped the writhing body, and powerful jaws snapped, tearing off the centipede's head. Numb with horror, I stared at the grotesque creature perched on the roof of its subterranean lair, devouring its still twitching prize. This creature somewhat resembled a human, though it was very small. Standing at full height, it was about a meter and a half tall. Squat and stocky, with long arms more akin to limbs, the creature would have resembled an ape if it weren't almost hairless. Short fur framed only its hideous face with a flattened nose and large mouth with drooping lips that exposed yellow fangs. Its pale, scaly skin was covered in dark spots, making it resemble that of a snake or toad. Its large, bulging eyes squinted as if accustomed to the darkness underground. Even the dim light of the setting sun was too bright for it. The emergence of the first creature seemed like a signal. Across the entire beach, the giant burrows began to open, and like large larvae, the underground creatures crawled out. Soon, the entire beach was teeming with these clumsy, grotesque beings, jostling and snapping at each other. Some were larger, some smaller, but overall the subterranean monsters were barely distinguishable from one another. Gradually, the repulsive being settled down in front of the dolmen, careful not to cross an invisible boundary, just as the mounds had not encroached on the area around the ominous structure. It was as if they were waiting for something, and I waited with them, though I was almost certain I wouldn't like what I was about to see. The sun sank lower until it finally disappeared and night fell. However, the moon quickly rose, illuminating everything around with its pale light. This seemed to be a signal for the creatures. One of them lifted its head and let out a long, drawn-out howl. The other monsters immediately joined in, their prolonged wailing sending a chill down my spine once again. The howl broke off at the highest note, after which silence fell. A brief silence because one of the creatures sitting by the water's edge suddenly began to mutter something under its breath. Then another, and another. Soon the entire assembly was chanting some incomprehensible incantation, swaying back and forth, twitching every part of their bodies. The monster's gleaming eyes were fixed on the black entrance of the dolmen, and I found myself staring intently there too trembling with fear at what might emerge from that dark hole. The darkness of the burrow was suddenly illuminated by the glow of two yellow lights. A deafening hiss echoed, and from the gloomy cave emerged a paw, long, thin, with sharp, curved claws. Frozen in terror, I watched as the loathsome creature slithered out, its enormous scaly body writhing. It might have been a snake, except it had thin limbs, eerily similar to human arms, and no snake could have such a head, with long, bristly hair like porcupine quills, sharp ears, and a thoroughly repulsive face. Thick lips curled into a vile grin, revealing enormous fangs between which a forked tongue flicked. The creature reared up, arching its long neck, its narrowed yellow eyes coldly surveying the bowed, huddled creatures before it. Suddenly, the monster's head darted forward, and its sharp fangs sank into the neck of one of its worshippers. The shriek was cut short as the monster bit down harder, and with its other paw, it grabbed the creature's legs and yanked downward. 
There was a sickening sound as there was a sickening sound as the underground creature's body was torn in half, its innards spilling out as blood gushed onto the black earth. With a grotesque slurping noise, the monster devoured the mangled corpse while its misshapen worshippers, mumbling incoherently, continued to bow and scrape in reverence. It was in that moment that the truth dawned on me. I finally understood why these dolmens had been constructed and what those who later built them were trying to emulate. These colossal megaliths served as gateways between worlds, between our own and those forbidden dark realms where horrific creatures roamed, the likes of which are hinted at in humanity's oldest and most terrifying legends. These wretched mutants that lived beneath the earth and worshipped these abhorrent monsters had managed to pass on their cult to the people who came here after them. Over time, the secret of summoning these demonic beings was lost, and now the bodies of the dead were laid inside the dolmens, so that the ancient deity could take what it was owed. The creature finished devouring its victim and lifted its grotesque, blood-stained head. Its gaze swept across the huddled, bent backs of its followers and suddenly froze, locking onto a single point. My heart seized with terror as I realized. It was looking directly at me. It could see me. The monstrous hiss echoed again, and the writhing body lunged forward. But I managed to recite the incantation just in time, and with immense relief, I saw everything around me begin to darken and lose its shape. The last thing I saw before I returned to my own time was the creature's slobbering, snarling maw wide open in front of my face. With a wild cry, I awoke from my stupor. Gripped by blind panic, I ran down the slope, every moment risking breaking my neck. Dirty and scratched up, I finally emerged onto one of the village streets and collapsed unconscious. Later, the local villagers, who still possessed some semblance of mercy, found me. They at least put me on a bus. When I got home, I immediately tore apart my laboratory, destroying all the substances that had birthed that monstrous concoction. Then I collapsed as if struck down. After sleeping for an entire day, I took all the flasks and bottles, full and empty, and hauled them to the nearest dump, where I burned all my books and records related to the occult. At the time, I thought it was all over. But a month later, I dreamt again of that moonlit clearing, the colossal dolmen, and the terrible creature crawling out of it. I woke up with a wild scream, drenched in cold sweat, my heart pounding furiously. The malicious hissing still echoed in my ears, and I could almost see, as if in reality, the flickering yellow eyes that seemed to haunt me even in my room. The next morning, I learned that a married couple in the neighboring apartment had been brutally murdered. Their bodies were mutilated as if they had been savaged by a wild beast. From the cautious whispers of the neighbors, I gathered that the bodies were smeared with some kind of slime, and the room itself reeked horribly. It was then that I realized the ancient creature was alive, and it had found its victim. Since then, I've changed addresses several times, though I know it's useless. The creature will find me wherever I go. The monster toys with me, appearing in my dreams and making me wake up each time with a terrified scream. And then I learn that somewhere nearby, another person has died a horrible death. Driven by irrational fear, I flee and hide again, though I know it's futile. But I won't do it anymore. I won't endanger those living around me. I sold my apartment and bought this ruin in an abandoned village. Hardly anyone lives here except for a few bitter drunks and ancient old women. But I hope the creature won't touch them. After all, I'm not planning to run anywhere. Let it come for me, and I will finally take to the grave the dreadful secret of the Dolmen Builders. A secret that is much more terrifying than just a cruel cult of a degenerate race. I have seen the face of the brutal deity of the subterranean inhabitants. 
Those monstrous features, though distorted and exaggerated by the hideousness of the subterranean mutants themselves, only a blind person wouldn't see the resemblance between them and the creature they worshipped. In what forgotten times did the ancestors of these wretches mix their blood with demonic offspring? And why? These shriveled, degenerate beings could never have built something as grand as the colossal dolmen. Does that mean they were different before they began worshipping the terrible deity? And the dolmen itself? Was it built specifically to summon the offspring of the outer abyss? I think so. There's little chance it could have happened by accident. The mixing of blood also must have been a voluntary agreement, but why? What could have been worth the loss of human appearance and the need for constant sacrifice to a terrifying monster? I think I know the answer. I've thought about it for a long time, and now I'm not so sure anymore. Was the dark-skinned people who inherited the tradition of building dolmens really engaged in mindless imitation? Perhaps their priests knew the secret meaning of these stone structures. Dolmens were built to bury leaders so they could join their ancestors. Ancestors who... No, it's too frightening to think about it further. Our previous ideas about the mysteries of life and death will prove fundamentally wrong. And the blissful tales of paradise and hell no more false than the rational and cynical views of atheists about complete non-existence. And what is the alternative? The ancient ape-like subhumans were smarter than us, binding their dead, any dead, and burying them face down. Because after death, a person turns into something else, and woe to the living if that something continues to interfere in earthly life. Isn't there an abundance of legends in various cultures where the line blurs between monsters that devour the dead and the living dead themselves? Aren't the Scandinavian legends of the Draver, the risen dead, intertwined with stories of serpent-like creatures devouring corpses? And aren't there stone megaliths in Scandinavia that resemble the Caucasian dolmens? I'm sitting on my bed feverishly scribbling in this battered notebook, trying to distract myself from the horrific fate that awaits me. I can already hear the hissing outside the window and the rustling of nettle bushes being pushed aside by a massive body. Now it's pounding against the closed shutters, which are creaking under its assault. But I'm no longer afraid of this meeting. I crave it because only then will I discover the final secret of the dolmens.